I hope you're ready to learn about a thrilling combinatorial game. The year is 1612, and a French mathematician by the name of Bachet de Maziriac, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that, but I gave it my best try, he released this book that has a name which translates to something like entertaining and delightful problems arising from numbers. And in this book, he had a lot of interesting recreational mathematics and math mathematical problems, and one of the things he had in the book was an analysis of a simple combinatorial game. Those familiar with game theory will know that it's certainly one of the younger branches of mathematics, not really being fully born, in many people's opinion, until 1944 with a book written by John von Neumann. So in terms of game theory, 1612 is going quite a ways back. Now, like I said, this game we're going to look at today was, as far as I can tell, I think it's the first first example I can find of a mathematical analysis being done and published on some combinatorial game. What does it mean for a game to be a combinatorial game? Well, chess is an example of a combinatorial game. It's a game where players take turns and have perfect information. So for example, in chess, players take turns and each player knows all moves that are available to them and all moves that are available to the opponent. The game also has a definite end state and there are no random elements involved. Now, the combinatorial game that Bashe de Maziriac published in his book and analyzed was much more simple and admits a simple analysis that we can walk through today. But first, let's go through what the heck the game was. In this simple game, players take turns alternately adding numbers from 1 to 10 to a running subtotal. So for example, the first player may choose 6, and now that's the running subtotal. The next player then may add 10 to this subtotal, thus our new subtotal is 16. The next player may add let's say 7 to this, and so our new running subtotal is 23, and so on. The first player to get the subtotal to 100 would be the winner of the game. So let me just continue writing out a possible sequence of states in this game. The second player could then add 9 to get us to 32, and we continue in this way until a winner is determined. So here's a potential sequence of game states where each player is choosing a number between 1 to 10 to add to the subtotal in each turn. And once we get to 100, that's the blue player who has got us to 100, and thus they are the winner. So that's how the game works. I invite you to pause the video and take a guess. Do you think the first player or the second player has the advantage in this game? Is there a winning strategy, strategy you can follow to win every game? What is that strategy? Well, we'll go through the analysis and answer all of these questions. First, I mean, we can learn where to start just by looking at this sequence of games game states. Note that I'm saying game states rather than turns, because really the state of the game is determined by the current subtotal and whose turn it is, and so that's what we see here. We're not seeing the moves. For example, here the green player has a subtotal of 32, and the move they made to get here was adding 9 to the total of 23. One of the things you quickly learn in analyzing combinatorial games is that it's often best to start at the end of a theoretical game and try to work backwards to figure out what the optimal strategy is. And a similar thing is true here. If we look at this winning play where the blue player gets to 100, of course they added 10 to 90 in order to get there, and certainly any any position between 90 and 99 would be a great position to be in, because if it's your turn and the subtotal is somewhere between 90 and 99, you can add whatever is necessary, something between 1 and 10, to get to that winning state of 100. Thus, when the green player adds, what did he add, 10 to this to get to 82, that was a disastrous play, because after getting to 82, the blue player is able to add 7 to get to 89, which thus forces the green player to then move this into some number between 90 and 99, where the blue player is going to have a guaranteed win. So here we see that 89 is for sure a losing position. If it's your turn and 89 is the current subtotal, then the least you could make it is 90 if you add 1, and the most you could make it is 99 if you add 10. But either way, the next player will be able to win on 
on their turn. So 89 is for sure a losing position. And perhaps we can color code these. So let's put the losing positions in red here on the right, and we'll put the winning positions in blue here on the left. By a losing position, we mean if it's your turn and this is the current subtotal, then you are going to lose. And as we discussed, one such number is 89. This is a position, if it's your turn and 89 is a subtotal, you're gonna lose, assuming the other player plays intelligently. And the reason this is a losing position is because all of the possible subsequent positions, namely everything from 90 to 99, those are all winning positions. A player who has 89 as their current subtotal is guaranteed to move the game into one of these positions, where the player whose turn it is can then win. Now from the fact that 89 is a losing position, we can conclude that everything from 79 to 88 is a winning position, because if it's your turn and this is the subtotal, something from 79 to 88, you can add whatever is necessary, something between 1 and 10, to get the position to 89, where it will then be the other player's turn and they're guaranteed to lose by putting you back in this winning position. This then, of course, means that we have an additional losing position, which is 78, because if it's your turn and the subtotal is 78, guaranteed you're going to put the next player into one of these winning positions, something between 79 and 88, then they can force your loss. And this pattern continues. We know that these are winning positions because from them you can move to 89, where the other player is stuck in a losing position. And similarly, since 78 is a losing position, we know that everything from 68 to 77 is a winning position, because from these positions you can force the other player to be in this losing position. Continuing the pattern, the next losing position is 67. You can see that the losing positions go down by increments of 11. That's because if you're in one of these positions, it's not possible to put the next player in another one of them because they're 11 apart and you can only add 10 at most. Since you can't force the other player to be in one of these positions if you are in them, then you get to basically be tossed around by the other player who gets to be in a winning position the entire time, and they can just keep sticking you back into these losing positions. And we'll just finish writing out the pattern here. 56 would also be a losing position, as would 45 and 34 and 23 and 12, and indeed one would be a losing position. Similarly, the winning positions will be all the positions from which you can force your opponent to be in a losing position. Now, of course, the initial position of the game is with that running subtotal of zero before anyone's done anything. So at last, is that a winning situation or a losing situation? In other words, is it advantageous to go first or to go second? Well, of course, it would be a winning position, that subtotal of zero, because if you start first, you can immediately put the second player into the losing position by adding one to the subtotal. So as the first player, you're guaranteed to win this simple game by simply continuing to put the second player into one of these situations where the subtotal is some number that's one greater than a multiple of 11. Thus, they're forced to eventually play from the 89 position position where they're going to set you up for your big win. I first read about this simple little game in this book from the Student Mathematical Library series from the AMS, but another source I saw talk about this game mentioned a slight variation. They just said that this was how the game worked, which is that instead of the subtotal being zero at the start, the players could actually choose to start with any number less than 30. In this case, of course, whether the first player has the advantage or not depends purely on what the starting number of choice is. If the starting number chosen is one of these losing positions, then the first player is going to lose. Otherwise, if it's one of these winning positions, then the first player has an easy path to victory. So you could try this game with your friends for some fun. I'd recommend that you let your friend go first before they've had that much time to think about the game, where hopefully they'll put you in one of these winning positions, and then you can lock down the W, and from there, insist that you always go first, and thus you'll always win from there on, and that is a very fun way to play. Let me know in the comments your thoughts, and if you have any questions, there is a rich field of combinatorial game theory, it's one of my favorite topics, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest 
math videos on the internet.